Yo, what is going on, everyone? My name is Nick, or The Notorious Fantasy, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about 10 players skyrocketing up my rankings in 2023 fantasy football. But before we can get on into these players, I would like to ask that if you guys are new to the channel and you do end up enjoying today's video, then please make sure to hit that subscribe button down below. And while you're down there, whether you are new to the channel or not, please make sure they do leave a like on today's video. It would help me out a ton. If you want to follow me on Twitter, please do so at NotoriousFNTSY. So without further ado, do let's get into 10 players that are skyrocketing up my rankings for 2023 fantasy football we begin with the first player skyrocketing up my rankings, 9-inch Nicholas Chubb, running back of the Cleveland Browns, current underdog ADP, running back for at pick 12.5. I've recently moved him ahead of Jonathan Taylor and Saquon Barkley, and he is now the running back number four in my rankings. Last season, he finished as the RB5 in half PPR and the RB6 in half PPR points per game. He played in all 17 games last season, having 302 carries, 17.8 per game, number three, 1,520. 25 rushing yards, 89.7 per game, also number three, 37 targets, number 31, 27 receptions, number 33, and 239 receiving yards, number 24 at running back, with 13 total touchdowns, number three. Now, entering into this season, the team is going to be without Kareem Hunt, and we have seen a lot of buzz out of training camp, and a lot of just normal thinking will point you to the fact that it seems like Nick Chubb is going to be a lot more involved in the receiving game. Now, is he magically going to turn into Alvin Kamara or Austin Eckler? Christian McCaffrey and catch potentially 100 balls this season? Probably not, but is he going to get the upside of maybe getting 60 plus targets? I definitely think so. I think this Cleveland Browns offense is going to look significantly better in 2023 compared to 2022. Now, obviously last year, things started off well with Jacoby Brissett, but once Deshaun Watson took over this offense, turned into a complete and utter fucking laughing stock, I think Deshaun Watson is going to look significantly better in 2023, and I think he's going to kind of wipe that rust off of him. He was ninth in true yards per carry last season, 13th in yards per touch, 4th in juke rate, and 6th in yards created. Again, I think this is going to be one of the best rushing offenses in the National Football League, and Nick Chubb is going to be carrying the rock at an absorbent rate. I think the Cleveland Browns are going to be much better than they were last season, and that added receiving upside of Nick Chubb is ultimately what pushed me to throw him ahead of Jonathan Taylor as well as Saquon Barkley. Most of the reason why I threw him above Jonathan Taylor, though, is because of the contract situation. We're still pretty unsure if Jonathan Taylor will even be an Indianapolis Colt come the next couple of weeks. I think he isn't going to end up holding out. I think he'll end up playing but it still is certainly up in the air right now. At number two, we have Alexander Madison running back of the Minnesota Vikings underdog ADP running back 18 at pick 58.3. Now initially, I was someone who was a little bit nervous about Alexander Madison and I have seen a lot of fantasy analysts kind of poo-poo Alexander Madison, try to talk themselves out of him, but in reality, I try to think of things in very simple ways, right? I'm not trying to overthink things, galaxy brain my way, out of talking myself, out of a running back that is in an amazing situation. Now, his stats last year are far from ideal, right? He was stuck behind Dalvin Cook, running back 49 half PPR and running back 65 and half PPR points per game. He played in seven ga 17 games. He played every single game, but he didn't start at all. He was 56th in carries, 60th in rushing yards, 61st in targets, 61st in receptions, 67th in receiving yards, and 22nd in total touchdowns. But when you actually go back and see how good Alexander Madison was, when he was given the opportunity to be the starter, we can tell that Alexander Madison does have the juice to be a lead back in the NFL. He was kind of just cucked by the fact that Dalvin Cook was ahead of him. Week 3 versus Seattle in 2021, there's a game where Dalvin Cook doesn't play. 26 carries for Madison, 6 receptions on 8 targets, 171 total yards, running back 7 on the week. Week 5, 2 weeks later, he gets 25 carries, 7 receptions on 7 targets for 153 total yards and 1 touchdown, running back 6 on the week. Now, I know a lot of people point to the fact that Ty Chandler and Dwayne McBride are there, but I don't think any of those running backs can even hold the jockstrap of Alexander Madison. I think it is very clear that Alexander Madison is the running back number one on this team. Again, I understand that under Kevin O'Connell, this is no longer this super run-heavy team like they were previously, right, where Dalvin Cook was the motor of this offense. Now they're trying to throw the ball a lot more, which makes a whole lot of sense because they have fucking Justin Jefferson Jefferson as their number one receiver, I would probably want to throw the ball a ton too if Jefferson was my number one option. But the fact is their defense stinks. 
They're going to be throwing the ball a lot late in games. They're going to be getting into scoring opportunities a bunch. And Alexander Madison, I get it. He only had 18 targets last year. But we saw in those games when Dalvin Cook was not there, he had eight targets and seven targets. Now, I don't think he's going to average seven or eight targets every single game. But could he get five targets every single game? Yes, and I think Alexander Madison is in a situation where he could finish as a top 12 running back. So coming off the board at running back number 18, this is a guy that I have been loving to target in fantasy drafts. Moving now to my number three player skyrocketing up my rankings, Kyle Pitts, tight end of the Atlanta Falcons, underdog ADP, tight end five at pick 70.6. Now, in prior seasons, I have been someone that has done a full-on fade on Kyle Pitts. Everyone has been hyping him up, and I said, you know what? I just don't get it. In his rookie year, the narrative was that he was going to magically break the curse of rookie tight ends not being all that amazing. Now, he kind of did, right? But he wasn't what a lot of people thought he would be. Last year, I faded him again because I was worried about the fact that the quarterback situation was garbage, and he was going pretty high. But the reason why I like him now is the fact that he's going much later. Pick 7. 70.6. He was the tight end 33 and half PPR last year and the tight end 20 and half PPR points per game. 10 games played, 59 targets, 24th at tight end, 28 receptions, 35th, 356 receiving yards, 30th, and two total touchdowns, number 32 at tight end. But in terms of efficiency, he was relatively efficient. Seventh in yards per reception, fifth in yards per team pass attempt. He only had one drop last season, and he was 13th in dominator rating at the tight end position. Now I fully understand that Desmond Ritter isn't the second coming of Patrick Mahomes, but I don't think Desmond Ritter needs to be this elite quarterback for Kyle Pitts to succeed. Kyle Pitts is a generational talent. This fucker has only scored three touchdowns in the NFL. He scored one his rookie year and then two last season. That is bound to change. Again, I don't think Ritter is all that amazing, but I don't think he has to be for Kyle Pitts to succeed. I feel as though this is going to be the year where we get that Kyle Pitts season that everyone has been dreaming of, right? Again, in prior seasons, everyone's getting on their knees giving Kyle Pitts the gawk gawk 9,000, but now that people are starting to get a little bit more nervous, now that his price is dropping, it makes it much more palatable to draft him. You're not paying that top four, top five, round pick to get him anymore. You can get him much later, and with the talent that he possesses in an offense that I expect to take a leap up, I am ecstatic to be drafting Kyle Pitts this year. Previously, I had him buried in my tight end rankings. I started to fade him early on the offseason, but I had an epiphany recently that's just telling me that based on where he's going, I want to be taking more shots on a guy that is as talented as Kyle Pitts. Moving now to the fourth player skyrocketing up my rankings, we got Quinton Johnston, wide receiver of the LA Chargers, current underdog ADP wide receiver 40 at pick 79.1. Now this is his rookie season. He was drafted at pick 21. Can you do something for me? In the first round of the 2023 NFL draft, he played three years at TCU. 13 games played in 2022, 60 receptions on 96 targets. You reverse that, 69 targets. Very nice, but 60 receptions on 96 targets. 1,069 receiving yards, 17.7 yards per reception, six tubs. 26.5 or 62.5 percent catch rate and a 21.2 percent target rate. Quinton Johnston is six foot three, 208 pounds, and he forced 18 missed tackles last season, ranking eighth among Power Five receivers. Prior to the NFL draft, PFF's Mitch Kaiser stated that his best NFL traits are height elusiveness, deep ball threat, acceleration, and body control. All things that I fully agree with when watching his tape. Reports out of camp early on was that he and Justin Herbert have been turning heads, right? Justin Herbert has been throwing the ball great to him, and Herbert himself has even spoken very highly of him. Now, obviously, Herbert is going to speak highly of any fucking wide receiver. You could go out there and play wide receiver, and he's probably going to hype you up. But honestly, I think this is a great spot for for Quinton Johnston. Now, it might take some time. I don't think Quinton Johnston's a guy that you necessarily want to be throwing in a lineup week one up against the Miami Dolphins, right? I think it might take a couple of weeks for him to truly crack your fantasy football lineup. But if something happens 
to Keenan Allen or if something happens to Mike Williams, knock on wood, we don't root for injuries, Quentin Johnston legitimately has top 24 wide receiver upside. I think he's going to be pretty reliable with some huge spike games this season because the LA Chargers have one of the best offenses in the NFL. I want to invest in rookie wide receivers in this range that I think are incredibly skilled in the draft, and I really do think Quentin Johnston has the upside to be the number one wide receiver in terms of fantasy scoring in the 2023 NFL draft class. Again, this is an offense that I want to have pieces of, and I think Quentin Johnston sneakily might be able to take some work away from Mike Williams and maybe, just maybe, score a zillion touchdowns because he's a big-bodied guy. I am very excited for Quentin Johnston and maybe the addition of Kellen Moore. I don't think this will actually happen, but... You know, Kellen Moore doesn't like the dump-offs going to the running back, so maybe we see a lot of targets for Quentin Johnson. Again, I'm not expecting Austin Eckler to fall off the face of the earth, but I think it could be possible, and that could boost up Quentin Johnson's value. So again, wide receiver 40, pick 79.1. This is definitely a guy that I've been looking to get on a lot of my teams. Moving to player number five, we got Elijah Moore, wide receiver of the Cleveland Browns. Underdog ADP, wide receiver 44, pick 87.2. If you guys have ended up enjoying thus far, make sure you hit that subscribe button as well as hitting that like button down below. So Elijah Moore was traded for a second round pick in exchange for Elijah Moore in a third round pick. Last year, things weren't great. Elijah Moore was not loving what was happening with the Jets and promptly got traded in 2023. So 16 games played with six starts in just an awful situation for the Jets. 66 targets, 37 receptions, 446 receiving yards, one total touchdown. None of those stats were even inside the top 60. But if you look at his efficiency stats, he was actually pretty efficient. The problem is the quarterback situation there was just sinking the ship. 6.4 target accuracy for Elijah Moore, 93rd. That is a combination of Mike Williams, Cool Joe Flacco, as well as the MILF hunter, Zach Wilson. Again, even with that garbage-ass quarterback play, 102.8% true catch rate, 5th, 2.14 target separation, 12th, and a 44.2% route win rate, 25th. I talked up the Cleveland Browns when I talked about 9-inch Nicholas Chubb, but to reiterate, I genuinely believe this is going to be an offense that looks significantly better than last season. Again, when you were watching Deshaun Watson last year, you are better off turning the fucking TV off, painting your wall, and watching the paint dry because Deshaun Watson was abysmally bad. It looked like Deshaun Watson legitimately forgot how to play football, but I think in 2023, the rust is going to come off and he is going to look like a much better player. And I've talked about this a ton on the channel. I don't think that Deshaun Deshaun Watson needs to become the former MVP caliber level quarterback that Deshaun Watson was early on in his Houston Texans career. As long as he is a top 10, top 12 quarterback in the NFL, Elijah Moore, Amari Cooper, Nine Inch Nicholas Chubb, these are guys that can flourish. I get they have other receivers on the team like Donovan Peoples-Jones, but I think Elijah Moore is a much better talent than him. And he's also incredibly fast. He ran a 4.35 40 at his pro day at Ole Miss. Again, his NFL stats are far from ideal, but I think being put into a much better situation here than early on with the Jets, Elijah Moore is in a very good situation. And again, I want to be taking pieces from an offense that I think is severely underpriced right now in fantasy. I think Amari Cooper's underpriced. I think Deshaun Watson might even be underpriced. I think the same thing goes with Elijah Moore. Moving to player number six here, we got Anthony Richardson, quarterback of the Indianapolis Colts. Colts, underdog ADP, quarterback 11 at pick 103.7, light FM, I think, it is it 106.7? You get what I mean, though. Maybe that's just a New Jersey thing. I don't know. But before we get on into Anthony Richardson, I'd like to give you guys a quick word for our friends and our sponsor over at Underdog Fantasy. Now, Underdog Fantasy is the best place to play best ball fantasy football this summer. If you don't know what best ball is, it's the best part about fantasy football. It's the draft. And that's it. You draft your team. After the draft, Underdog automatically puts the highest scores into your lineup at the end of the week. So there's no setting your lineup. There's no trades. And there's no waiver wire. You draft your team. And that's it. Again, at the end of every single week, Underdog automatically throws the highest scores into your lineup for you. They have the biggest fantasy football contest ever. Best Ball Mania 4. $25 to enter. 150 max entries. 
Three million dollars in first place, fifteen million in total prizes. They're also going to have smaller contests, like they had the Hound Dog last week. Only ten dollars to enter. There's going to be contests: five dollars to enter, seven dollars to enter, three dollars to enter. That they're probably going to keep dropping as well. And they also have quote unquote cash games, which is more like a regular league. You could. Get a buy-in as low as $3. You draft against 11 other people, a 12-team league. The top two places make money. I think it's the best way to practice for your 2023 fantasy football draft. If this interests you in any way, make sure you sign up using the link in the video description or promo code Notorious for a first match deposit bonus of up to $100. So you deposit $100. They give an additional $150, additional $50, $25, and additional $25. Please make sure that you guys check that out again. Link in the video description. Moving back on into the video here, we got Anthony Richardson, quarterback of the Indianapolis. Colts. Now, last year, obviously, Matt Ryan struggled mightily. It was bad. It was like in that story about the guy trying to get the fucking sword out of the stone. You know what I'm talking about? That old tale where no one can get it out right. He struggled in a big way, right? It was like when you're trying to get ready to have sex and your dick just can't get hard, right? Matt Ryan. He's so old, he was in need of Viagra, right? It did not work at all. They fire Frank Reich. They bring in Jeff Saturday. They play uh, other quarterbacks, right? They had fucking Sam Ellinger step foot onto the field. I think even nine-inch Nicholas Foles played quarterback for the team. But now Richardson is under, for his year one, Shane Steichen, who had Jalen Hurts playing out of his mind last year in Philly. It is pretty clear to me that he's going to be the starter. He has been taking a majority of the snaps with the starters, and he he absolutely butt-fucked the Colts defense over the last two practices. He has been wheeling and dealing in the red zone. Michael Pittman Jr. has sung his praises. And again, he's coming off the board on underdog quarterback 11. I mean, like ESPN, Yahoo drafts. Sometimes he goes as late as quarterback number 20. This is a guy that I get maybe you're not super confident in starting in week one. You might not want to start him in his first ever game. You can draft another guy with Anthony Richardson, right? Play Kirk Cousins, Daniel Jones, Geno Smith, Jared Goff ahead of him for week one. But I really think this guy has what it takes to be a top three, top five quarterback in fantasy football. 12 games played in 2022 at Florida, 327 passing attempts, 2,546 passing yards, 7.8 yards per attempt, 17 passing touchdowns with nine interceptions, and 654 rushing yards. Player profiler ranks all the players all time at the quarterback position in athleticism, this motherfucker ranked number one. Again, I get that this guy isn't the best passer on earth. I get that he's not going to slice the defense in half fruit ninja style like Patrick Mahomes or Joe Burrow, these guys that can just dice the defense up, Tom Brady, right? He's not going to do that. But I think he's going to be a better actual passer than people think. Again, everything out of training camp has been very positive that he's looking good. Now, the Colts defense aren't the second coming of the 85 Bears. They're not the best defense to ever grace God's earth. But at the end of the day, they are they're an NFL defense, and Anthony Richardson is slicing them up. The wide receiver core there is pretty, eh. I mean, I like Michael Pittman Jr. a ton. They have Josh Downs, Alec Pierce, so not the best receiver core in the NFL, but also not awful. I think if Jonathan Taylor does return to this team, it will help out Anthony Richardson because they're going to be able to establish the run better. But even so, Richardson's a guy that if Jonathan Taylor isn't there, could literally be the goal line back for the team. I am ecstatic about Anthony Richardson. Again, the fact that Stain Shane Steichen is there. I always say this guy's name wrong and people always fucking hound me in the comment section. But Shane Steichen is, I think he's going to be legit for Anthony Richardson. I am very excited about this. And again, I think people are sleeping on him. I might even fuck around and have him ranked as like quarterback eight come late August when I release more of my quarterback rankings. Next up, we move to player number seven here, and that is going to be Zach Charbonnet. And we ain't talking about Carbonet or Cabernet, the wine. I don't drink wine. But Zach Charbonnet, running back of the Seattle Seahawks, underdog ADP, running back 35 at pick 105.8. Charbonnet hurt his shoulder a couple of days ago, and it seemed like everything was falling down. It seemed like my world, everything was shattered around me. It seemed like, oh my God, Charbonnet is going to need surgery. And I started to shit bricks. But then, like, three days later, he's at practice. He's at practice. Fucking practice. And now Kenneth Walker is dealing with a groin injury. Went too much fucking. We could see Charbonnet chip eat into that starting running back role when, Char when, when Kenneth Walker's gone. And what happens if this groin injury is really serious? What happens if this knocks him out literally until the start of the season? 
What if he's not fully healthy to go week one? Charbonnet could legitimately take that role. We heard earlier on in the offseason, after Pete Carroll drafted Zach Charbonnet in the second round, hey, we're going to have a running back battle here. You remember, Kenneth Walker was also a second round draft pick. Charbonnet, pick 53 in the second round. Played four years in college, two at Michigan, uh, before transferring to UCLA. Ten games in UCLA in 2022 as a 21-year-old. 195 rushes for 1,359 yards, 37 receptions on 321 receiving yards, 11.2% target share, two straight seasons, back-to-back Jordan 96-97 of over 1,000 rushing yards at UCLA, 4.53 40-yard dash. So again, he's not like... Not like... OJ Simpson running away from the cops. He doesn't got that crazy Hussein Bolt speed, but it's 71st percentile, six foot, 214 pounds. And again, he is a great pass catcher in college. When you see 37 receptions, like I know that doesn't seem like a lot in the NFL, but for college, it really is. Again, I think this is an offense that's going to be high flying, a great offense in the national football league. And if Kenneth Walker, if this is like serious, Garbonet could really shoot up the board. And even if Walker just misses a couple of weeks, I think that could really help Charbonnet cut further into his role and give Charbonnet even more value this season. And again, if something was to happen to Walker, knock on wood, we don't refer injuries, but Zach Charbonnet could weekly be ranked as like running back 14. And when you get that at running back 35 plus over pick 100, you're laughing straight to the bank. Moving next to player number eight, skyrocketing up my fantasy football rankings. It's Odell. Now I know. I have been basically the most anti-Odell man that lives on earth. I have been for years fading Odell Beckham Jr. like it was my job. Full on fade. But I had some realization recently that I need to just take him. Shod Master Bateman, or Shod Bateman is dealing with injuries. Dave Flowers is a rookie. Odell could legitimately score 10 plus touchdowns in this offense because under Todd Monken, they're going to be looking to throw the ball more. Underdog ADP wide receiver 52 at pick 109. So if you were really worried about Odell Beckham Jr., right, maybe you were cautious entering into this year because the injury, all that, I get it. But for me, early on in fantasy drafts, I talk about this a ton. You want to be as risk averse as possible. You want to keep things safe. But as you get deeper and deeper into the draft, you rip the condom off, you go in there raw, right? You're trying to Take risks that could legitimately hit the metaphorical nuts to where you drafted Odell wide receiver 52 and he finished as wide receiver 22, right? And you look like a genius. Going back to 2021 with the Rams for his stats since he didn't play last season, the stats were nothing crazy. Wide receiver 55 and half PPR, 59 and half PPR points per game, 14 games played with 13 starts, 82 targets, 47th, 44 receptions, 57th, 537 receiving yards, 60, uh, 62nd, five total touchdowns, 33rd. He was 38th in route win rate. Again, nothing special with the Rams, but the Rams also had Cooper fucking Cup. Right? The Ravens don't have Cooper Cup. The Ravens have Bateman, Flowers, and Mark Andrews. I love Mark Andrews. Mark Andrews could hurt Odell Beckham, but also could make him better because the defense can't just focus on Beckham in the red zone or Mark Andrews because they are both... Some of the best ball hawks, some of the best red zone targets in the National Football League, in my opinion. Lamar is able to stay healthy and Odell is able to stay healthy. I think this could be a great pick. Now, something I also want to mention real quick before we pivot to the next guy. There is the name factor with Odell that could have him potentially moving up in drafts just from name value alone. So I think if you are in leagues with more casual players, you're not in the more sharp leagues, there there is a chance that Odell becomes like a seventh round fantasy pick because... People know who Odell is, right? When you get later on the draft, it's like, oh, should I draft, for instance, Quentin Johnston? Or should I draft Odell? Or should I draft Elijah Moore? Or should I draft Odell? Some people might just draft Odell. Again, I like all these guys. But they might draft him way too high because they know who he is. He has huge name value. He is even... People who don't even watch football know who the fuck Odell Beckham Jr. is. So that is something that does concern me a little bit. But I think the odds that he's the wide receiver one in this offense, it's not like impossible for it to happen. So for that reason alone, I think he's worthy of a pick super late. And I'm definitely going to have him ranked higher than wide receiver 52. Moving next to player number nine here, we got my boy, baby Chark, baby Chark, DJ Chark, wide receiver of the Carolina Panthers, underdog ADP, wide receiver 70 at pick 154.3. Just like with Odell, I legitimately think DJ 
DJ Chark could be the number one receiver in this Carolina Panthers offense. Underdog ADP wide receiver 70 at pick 154.3. Now, the other wide receivers, they have Terrence Marshall. They have old man Adam Thielen. They have Jonathan Mingo, who sounds like a porn star, and LaVishka Chenault, right? So Thielen, he's done it at the NFL level, of course. He's done it big at the NFL level, right? Thielen's a great player. I'll give him his respect, but he's aging. Harris Marshall hasn't done anything in the NFL. Jonathan Bingo's a rookie, and LaVisca Chenault uh, is everyone's favorite gadget player in the NFL that really hasn't done much. Early reports out of camp are that Chark has gained the trust of Bryce Young, and that anytime Bryce sees him in a one-on-one situation, Bryce is going to take that chance. Frank Reich said that it seems like they're connecting every single practice. So when you're going late in these drafts, I understand that no one really expects the Carolina Panthers to be these world beaters. I don't think they're necessarily going to be the worst team in the division. That's probably going to be the Bucs, but they're going to be just a decent team, right? But under Frank Reich with rookie quarterback Bryce Young, a guy who everyone liked coming out of Alabama, it seems pretty plausible that the number one receiver on this team would have great fantasy value. And all of them are going late. So if you wanted to say, Nick, I actually like Thielen better, or I like Marshall, Mingo, Chenault, probably not Chenault, but if you said, oh, I want to draft Terrace Marshall, I want to draft Thielen, I want to draft Mingo, then go right ahead. Take your shot on this with one of those guys, because having the number one wide receiver on any team, valuable. He had 52 targets last year in Detroit, 11 games played, 10 starts, wide receiver 70 and half PPR, 56 and half PPR points per game, 52 targets, 30 receptions, 502 receiving yards, three total touchdowns. He was buried on the Lions depth chart, but the Lions had some actually skilled wide receivers, whereas the Panthers, it's pretty clear to me, at least on paper, that Chark would be the best wide receiver there. We've seen Chark do it before in the NFL. I know it feels like fucking ages ago when he was balling in Jacksonville, but again, I do think the talent is there with him. And like I'm, I've been saying a lot is if you're taking a shot on, you're taking a shot on Chark, who could literally be the wide receiver one on his team. And there's other wide receivers going that range where there is no way in hell that like Curtis Samuel is going to go ahead and go past Jahan Dotson and go past McLaurin and be the number one receiver, right? There's just literally a 0% chance that that could happen. Another guy who I like super deep in here, but I've talked about him a ton, so I don't include him in the video. I love Isaiah Hodgins. That guy could be the number one receiver on the Giants. So take these shots super late on these kind of four non-clear teams, right? It's a smoky room, right? Smoking in the boys' room. It's a smoky room. You just take your shots. Take your shots. If I was doing three drafts, probably I, th- I like DJ Chark the most. So say I'm doing five drafts, I'd probably take DJ Chark twice. i take Marshall in another one, Mingo in the other one. Right? That's four drafts. And then I'm taking... Thielen in the other one. So yeah, I think that this is something you want to take advantage of. Take shots on these Panthers wide receivers late because you might fuck around and find a guy that is a flex start weekly for your team. Moving to the final player here, my boy, John Mechie, the third wide receiver of the Houston Texans. Underdog ADP wide receiver 75 at pick 173.8. Now, everyone who has been, if you've watched my videos before, you know, I love Nico Collins. I've been talking Nico Collins up all offseason with Brandon Cooks exiting. I think that the clear number one candidate to be the number one guy is Nico Collins. But I would be foolish to tell you that I don't think Mechie could become the number one guy. And maybe this Houston Texans offense is actually good enough with CJ Stroud, with the new head coach, getting out Lovey Smith. Uh, Bye bye, Davis Money Mills, you giraffe neck piece of shit. Now, maybe Mechie and Nico Collins can have a symbolic relationship and both thrive in fantasy. They're both super late options. Mechie, again, wide receiver 75, pick 173.8. When you are going that deep, a lot of the time, you're not even being selected in most drafts. Mechie missed all of last season after being diagnosed with leukemia. Very sad. Sucked for him. Obviously, he was a second round pick in the 2022 NFL draft, mostly because he tore his ACL in the 2021 SEC Championship game, I believe, against Georgia. Right? That's not great. You tear your ACL, and then boom, you have leukemia. That fucking sucks, but he beat it. Shout out to the boy Mechie for that. Now he's going into this year. It's year one, right? It's his second year, but in reality, it's year one. And he's also a decent time past that ACL tear. So 2021, 13 games played at Alabama. This man commanded a 23.3% target share at Alabama. At Vanderbilt, this isn't at Purdue. This is where the legitimate best of the best in college football are playing 
at fucking Alabama and you're commanding 23.3% target share. 96 targets on or 96 receptions on 133 targets, 1142 receiving yards, 11.9 yards per reception. Again, 23.3% target share, 72.2% catch rate and eight total touchdowns. The other receivers outside of Nico Collins are Robert Woods, Xavier Hutchinson and Tank Dell. Robert Woods is basically rolling up to fucking training camp and he's got the handicap sticker on his car because he's too fucking old to drive, right? John Mechie could elevate to the number one receiver role and that's why I'm taking shots on him. Again, he was good in college. Actually, great in college. Dominant in the SEC. I think he's going to be great at the NFL level as well. I still would tell you that I think Nico Collins has the better shot to be the wide receiver one, but it wouldn't be that out of the ordinary. I don't have to do some crazy mental gymnastics in here to figure out that there is a chance that Mechie becomes the number one receiver. So thank you guys all so much for watching. If you did end up enjoying this video, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below as well as hit that like button. Let me know about all of these players. Do you guys like them? Do you hate them? And who's a player that's skyrocketing up your rankings after a lot of this training camp news has went down? It's still early in august we still got a lot of preseasons games to go things are still going to change so i'll probably make an update video a couple weeks from now but i do appreciate all you guys for watching i love you guys so much hope you have a great guys day and as always good boy make sure you guys check out underdog as well good boy